1791, a warrant was issued for the arrest of James DeWolf of Bristol, Rhode Island. He was charged with the murder during the notorious Middle Passage from West Africa to Cuba of one of the 142 enslaved Africans on board his slave ship, Polly. When a specific captive came down with smallpox, Captain DeWolf ordered her quarantined. As the woman's condition worsened, DeWolf became concerned that his crew and his entire cargo of slaves would become infected, and so he ordered the enslaved woman, dead or dying of smallpox, to be thrown into the Atlantic. The crew hesitated. The captain decided, therefore, to do it himself. He tied the woman to a chair, gagged her, and with the help of another crew member, lowered her into the Atlantic. After selling the remainder of his human passengers in Cuba, DeWolf returned to Bristol, where he learned of a warrant for his arrest. He left immediately, one step ahead of the law. Word spread about what happened on the Polly and on the Caribbean island of St. Eustasis and later on St. Thomas, DeWolf was charged with murder. Each time the charges were dropped. At one trial, a crew member testified that the African was humanely thrown overboard. In the other trial, the judge pronounced DeWolf a cruel and immoral person. Yet under the circumstances, the captain acted prudently to save the others from possible death. DeWolf went on to become one of the wealthiest men in America, a United States Senator, and the largest slave trader in U.S. history. From 1769 to 1820, 12 years after the United States Constitution prohibited the importation of slaves, DeWolf and his extended family brought approximately 12,000 Africans across the ocean making a fortune, buying, and selling human beings. It was also estimated that as many as 60% of the slaves brought to America between 1650 and 1808 arrived aboard Rhode Island-owned ships. Hi, I'm Tom Army, and this is part two of a two-part series about slavery in the North as part of our continuing and sometimes painful investigations into our nation's past. Welcome. This is United States History Online. The story about the connection between Rhode Island, slavery, and the slave trade began over 100 years before the DeWolf family started trafficking in African slaves. Records indicate that black slaves were in the colony as early as 1652. Now, since Roger Williams established the colony as a safe haven from religious persecution, a small percent of the white population were Quakers. These Rhode Island Quakers started to question the morality of slavery, and they strongly suggested to the General Assembly that the colony should differentiate itself from Puritan Massachusetts, a colony that had legalized slavery in 1641. The Rhode Island Assembly responded with the first anti-slavery statue in the colonies. The law only applied to blacks and whites in Providence and Warwick and banned lifetime ownership of all indentured servants. For a period of 10 years or less, however, a person was still permitted to own an indentured servant. Then in 1676, the General Assembly prohibited the enslavement of Native Americans. As a result of King Philip's War, the colony preferred to expel or exterminate Native Americans. Unfortunately, the 1652 and 1676 laws banning slavery 
were not enforced. And there were four reasons for this. First, throughout the latter half of the 17th century, colonies were wrestling with laws about slavery. Should they include Native Americans, Africans, or indentured servants as England preferred? Second, by 1700, Rhode Island had become the only New England colony to use slaves for both plantation labor and trade. A slave-based economy existed in Narragansett, or South Country. For example, Robert Hazard of South Kingston owned 12,000 acres and had 24 slave women just to work in his dairy. Third, slave trade monopolies were starting to break up, and wealthy Rhode Islanders needed laborers and craftsmen, as did nearby New London, Connecticut. Consequently, slaves began to arrive in Newport. Fourth, the colony had just begun to depend on sugar from the West Indies in order to distill rum. Rum then became the commodity used to purchase slaves and sugar. The result of this perfect storm of forces was that the colony's 1652 anti-slavery law was superseded by a law in 1703 legally recognizing black and Native American slavery with whites as owners. There was nothing inevitable about racial slavery. Conscious choices were made. From 5.9% of the population in 1708, black slaves rose to account for over 10% of Rhode Island's population in 1755. And one year before Lexington and Concord, the slave population in the colony was 6.3%. One historian wrote, quote, altogether, 204 different Rhode Island citizens owned a share or more in a slave voyage at one time or another." End quote. Other families made their fortune in ancillary professions such as distillers, bankers, insurers, and merchants. From 1732 to 1764, annually, 18 ships set sail to West Africa carrying 1,800 hogsheads of rum, which was traded for slaves, who were then sold in the West Indies, South Carolina, or New England. Those sold in the West Indies were exchanged for sugar, which was used by the 30 distilleries in Rhode Island to produce rum, and the triangle trade cycle was then repeated. The Brown family, mercantile leaders in the state, were involved in the slave trade beginning with brothers James and Obadiah. Neither were successful. In 1764, James's sons, Nicholas, John, Joseph, and Moses, financed the slave ship Sally. But the venture turned out disastrously, costing the brothers approximately $12,000, a fortune at that time. From this point forward, only John continued in the slave trade, albeit in a minor capacity. Moses took a different path. The profit that the family had made on the exploitation of others, including Native Americans and African slaves, began to bother Moses Brown. So he decided to sever ties to slavery, to set his own slaves free, and to embrace the tenets of the Quakers. Moses Brown's actions brought him into direct confrontation with his brother John. As obvious a moral affront as slavery appears today, most people in the 18th century believed ending slavery would undermine the entire social order. Historian Charles Rapley wrote, quote, there was no consensus on the evils inherent to slavery at the time Moses freed his slaves in 1773. 
slavery appeared as universal and as immutable as human nature, end quote. During the American Revolution, and in its immediate aftermath, the two brothers, John and Moses Brown, were on opposite sides of the slavery issue, as were Quaker abolitionists and the Newport shipping interest. The Rhode Island General Assembly passed a legislative compromise in 1784 calling for the gradual emancipation of slaves. No slaves, however, were emancipated outright. Furthermore, the compromise law allowed ship owners to continue to participate in the foreign slave trade. When the legislation proved difficult to enforce, Moses, along with a number of other men, formed the Abolition Society of 1789. John Brown, not to be confused with the John Brown who led a slave rebellion in 1859 at Harper's Ferry, continued slave trading until 1796 when he was charged with violating the Federal Slave Trade Act of 1794, making it illegal to outfit slave ships in American ports. It was the Abolition Society that petitioned the U.S. District Attorney to bring actions against Brown. He was found not guilty. This court decision convinced many that the new legislation was useless against the wealthy and powerful. It was certainly useless against James DeWolf and his family of slave traders. In anticipation of the 1808 U.S. Constitution ban on importing slaves, Article 1, Section 9, DeWolf asked then-President Thomas Jefferson for a political favor. Jefferson obliged. The Federal Customs District, based in Newport, was divided into two districts, Newport and Bristol. Furthermore, Jefferson appointed Charles Collins, brother-in-law of James DeWolf, the customs official in Bristol. Collins looked the other way as George DeWolf, James's nephew, kept up the illegal slave trade until 1820. Historian Christian Appy wrote, quote, Only an honest accounting of our history will allow us to chart a new path in the world, end quote. When it came to the institution of slavery, Another historian described Rhode Island from 1703 to 1820 as the Deep North. Do you recognize the illusion? Do you agree with it? Given that many New Englanders are unaware of the history of slavery in their states, would you say with certainty that the citizens of Rhode Island exhibited moral outrage over the issue of slavery in the New World.